Welcome into another edition of Draft Journeys here on Caesar Sportsbook. Trey Wingo here, delighted to be joined for this edition with one of the greatest running backs in the history of the New Orleans Saints franchise, their first round pick in 2001, Deuce McAllister. Deuce, what's up, man? Not too much, Trey. How you doing, buddy? Doing really, really well. So your your draft was interesting on a couple of levels. Number one, yeah. uh, you were in that draft. LT was in that draft. Mm-hmm. What were your expectations about where you thought you might go uh, knowing the other people that were in that first round draft with you? Well, I, I had a pretty good inclination that I would be a first rounder. Um, you know, for me, with the teams that I had talked to, the teams that I had visited, you know, I really felt that I was going to be a top 10 pick, you know, potentially top five pick, you know, particularly with the teams that you had visited. But obviously we know that did not occur. And it's interesting that you asked just because I declined an opportunity to go to New York. Yeah. And one of the reasons uh, not going, I never got a guarantee from the teams in the top 10. And, you know, you go back to 2001, uh, those first round, those picks, they were about 15 minutes a piece. Yeah. So if you're not, you know, within that first five minutes, those minutes become, I mean, those first five picks, those minutes become a very, very long green room by yourself. Yeah, we, we call that now the Aaron Rodgers experience. Uh, he was sort of the poster child for that, just waiting uh, there to get picked. Um, it, it's funny, the draft is so different now, even than it was in 2001. I mean, it, it was always one of my favorite things. I was happy to be a part of it forever. But before we get into how the draft has changed, there's there's always two sort of mindsets, I think, with people that are in the draft. A, if it's my position, I want to be the first to go and it's a competition. Or B, I just want to be drafted and take it from there. What did you have any conversations with Ladanian about who's going to be number one? Was that sort of a a competition between you guys at all? I think it was a competition. I think, you know, uh, I got to meet really Ladanian. uh, It was our junior years. And at that time I was rated the number one running back at that time. And it was just really getting to know him, you know, as a person. And so, you know, I think there was always a friendly competition, between us to say, hey, look, I'm going to be the first guy taken or, you know, this mock draft has me being taken first or this this uh, analyst has, uh, you know, him being taken first. So I think it was a, a goal of both of ours to be that first guy taken. And obviously you look at what he was able to, to, to accomplish, a Hall of Fame career, a great person and has done a lot, you know, not only uh, for, for the Chargers, uh, but, you know, after football as well. So you went 23rd overall, again, a little farther than you thought you were going to go. Um, how did you kill the time, right? Because you weren't, like you said, you weren't in New York because you didn't get the uh, you didn't get the the guarantee, as a lot of players say, I won't go unless I know I'm going to be up there. So what were you doing in those 15-minute intervals between picks 6, 7, through, all the way through 23 with the Saints? After pick 8 or 9, it was really Chicago and San Francisco that, that were my – I don't want to call them fallback teams, but after that, you know, I think it was like eight and nine for San Francisco and and, and Chicago. I knew that the next four or five teams didn't need running backs just because either they had just drafted one a year before and or they had signed one as far as via free agency. So they were off my radar. I stopped watching the draft. I mean, and, and, and this this is really when cell phones had really yeah. just started to come out. Correct. Um, kind of turned it off because I knew nobody would be calling. And so the next two hours, hour and a half, they were long. They were long. And you start to wonder. You start to question. You know, you, you, you reach out to your agent, you know, and they're just trying to say, hey, look, be patient. Uh, a lot is going on. We're talking to some teams. But I'm thinking, like, Nobody's called. Nobody has picked me. So uh, you're upset. You're hurt. And mm-hmm. so um, it's just, look, I'm stopped watching it. Uh, I had some family and friends in, uh, at, at the house. And, you know, you didn't want to show them the disappointment, disappointment, but you were disappointed. So what was your pre-draft relationship or conversations uh, like with the Saints? Because you just alluded to it. They, you went through a bunch of teams. Well, they're not going to pick me because they have a running back or they just drafted one. Yeah. I mean, Ricky Williams, literally just a couple of years before that, they traded their entire draft to get Ricky Williams. So what was that pre-draft conversation or was there one with the Saints? It was a, hey, how you doing? And uh, yeah, you guys are down in New Orleans. I've been down to New Orleans a couple times and 
that that was it. I mean, there was no, and that visit really literally happened at the combine, and I'd never even spent any time with them. Uh, it, it was uh, the GM at the time was Randy Mueller, and the head yeah. coach was Jim Hazlitt, and it was literally just shaking their hands because I was from Mississippi, and New Orleans was two and a half hours away from 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 my house, and obviously you knew about the team, you knew their story, you talk about Ricky Williams, uh, you know, and having a lot of respect for him, but like you said. They gave up six or seven picks. There's no way that they're looking at another running back two years later. And so there was really zero interaction with the New Orleans Saints. So when they called and they said, we're going to take you with the 23rd overall pick, what was your level of shock? I was really shocked because I was on the phone with the Minnesota Vikings and uh, <laughs> Coach Denny Green, yeah. who had the next pick after the New Orleans Saints at 24, and it, it, it was interesting because around pick 16 or 17, um, I started getting like little dings as far as uh, I, I turned my phone. I didn't turn it off. I turned it on yeah. silent. Right. But you start getting messages being left. And it was uh, my agent trying to get in contact with me because teams had started to try to see if they could move up around pick 16 or 17. And I remember specifically one was like um, it was Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay Buccaneers needed an offensive lineman. They ended up taking Kenyatta Walker, uh, another guy that was from Mississippi, played at Florida, uh, and, and and they ended up taking him. But some teams, the New Orleans Saints, Minnesota, Chicago, San Francisco, they were trying to either move back into the first round or move up to take me. And, and that's really where I started to learn the business side of the draft because if a player that a team likes is on the board, then they're probably not going to trade that pick to another team that wants to move up. I remember, uh, I can't remember what pick it was, but St. Louis uh, Rams were on the clock, obviously the LA Rams now. Yeah. And they were like, we've got a player identified and he's, if he's on the board, we're not trading our pick. Well, the player that they end up draft, drafting was Adam Archuleta, another fantastic yeah. player that had an uh, outstanding career. And so at that point you knew that teams were really interested in trying to make a play, but no one really was able to pull off a trade. And obviously, you know, with New Orleans, it was their pick and they, they were able to pick me at the with the 23rd pick. So you get there and they have Ricky Williams. What did mm -hmm. they tell you about, hey, you know, we just use our best draft capital uh, to bring you in here, even though we have Ricky, like what, what were they telling you how this was all going to work? Didn't really have a plan at that point. You know, they were just like, hey, look, you were the best player on our board. And yeah. we felt like you were just too good to pass up and we'll figure it out. We'll make it work. And so that was basically the plan for me. And so in a sense, uh, I had a redshirt year. And that's just being honest. I, I, I carried the football 16 times the complete year. Once a game. And, you know, once a game, basically. And so... Uh, it was interesting. I, I I did learn a lot from Rick, you know, just seeing him work, his work that, that how he went out and just he put in work, yeah. you know, and now we know later on some of the things that he was dealing with off the field and personally. But at that time, that was not the case. And so just trying to learn as much as possible and trying to figure out how to be a pro as well. Those were some of the things that really I experienced my uh, rookie year. And then after that, they trade Ricky. And obviously, you knew that was your opportunity. Yeah, and it, it was basically like, are you ready? Do you want the workload? You know, and uh, for me, it was like, of course, I want to go out and prove and show that I was worthy of the pick and I want to show that I can compete in the NFL. And so you would watch some of the top guys. You would watch LaDamian Thomas. You would watch, you know, what, what Tiki Barber was doing, what Priest Holmes was doing. You know, you, you, you talk about Clinton Portis, some of the things that those guys were when they were – uh, there as well. You would watch and see what they were doing because you wanted to prove and show that I can do that as well. So right now, uh, you, you you came to the league out of Ole Miss, and uh, obviously mm -hmm. you're only two and a half hours away, as you said. Right now, the SEC is the draft. You know, I mean, it really yeah. is. Every year, it, it's 10 to 15 guys that are taken out of the mm -hmm. SEC. It wasn't that way when you were there. I mean, the SEC was strong when you, you know, Miami was a powerhouse. Are we talking, mm -hmm. you know, a, other conferences were considered comparable. Um, what do you think of now when you see the stranglehold that the SEC has on the NFL draft, especially in the first round? 
Well, I think it was just truly the development as far as putting funds into the universities and say, look, we can develop these guys. We can win. And what really just blew it up, it's the TV deals. Yeah. I mean, that, that that's really now the funding was there that they could reinvest back in the schools. And you talk about, you know, I've got I've got friends that Midwest and up north and it was like, hey, look, you know, the, the explosion of seven on seven has taken it to another level because here it's just go outside and just go play. And it has some structure to it. And so I think with the TV deals being able to really explode uh, the universities as far as what they can uh, invest back into the schools, that's really where the SEC has taken off. Yeah, it absolutely has. And again, I think the over-under this year uh, at Caesars for SEC selections of the first round is 10 and a half. And I wouldn't be shocked if it sailed past that, the way things yeah. have gone. Then there's the running back position, right? Uh, when you and LT came out, that was a staple. And we saw uh, every year we saw a bunch of running backs go in the first round. Well, right now the over-under for running backs going in the first round is 0. 0.5, as in the under is zero, <laughs> as in no running backs go in the first round. What do you make of how that position is being developed and how it's being drafted right now? Well, that breaks my heart, you know, uh, and, and, but I think I think when you look at it, you know, even when you talk about 20 years ago when, when I was in the NFL and got drafted, I knew that I was going to touch the ball 25 to 30 times. That, that was going to be a given. But the way the league has changed and it has truly become a passing league, that's what teams do. You know, you, you, you always talk about how do you build your team? Well, it's going to be normally with good defense and running the football. Now, via, you know, the, the, the passing advantage that you have with the elite quarterbacks to be able to go out there and how you can protect those quarterbacks. And now um, some of the rules, how it makes it tougher on defensive backs, you know, to be able to tackle, to be able to coverage. It's easy to throw the football, you know, and you, you talk about with inclement weather. Then, yes, you have to be able to run the football in most cases. But then I think also when you talk about evaluating running backs. Does this guy fit the system? Uh, can I find somebody similar uh, in a later round? I think that's one of the things that has hurt also for, for, for those running backs. Listen, the way you ran uh, was, was pretty, here I am, try and stop me. Is there mm -hmm. a guy that's in the league today that says, yeah, he ran like I used to run? Well, I mean, I, I love the games of a lot of different players. I mean, yeah. you, you look and you see, you know, even for myself, I wanted to be able to say I could catch like Marshall Falk. You know, you want to be a power guy and be able to go and run over guys. You know, Agent P Peterson was a little bit after me, but I knew AP and say, hey, look, I'm going to be violent. I'm going to yeah. be physical. And so it's always taking a little bit of, of, of somebody's game and marrying it to yours. I mean, but you, you look at some of the stuff that the guys are doing now. It's like, hey, can I be a three down back? but I have to be able to run the football uh, physically and be able to just be able to dominate. And so there, there are a lot of guys that I really like as far as in the league now that their game, I would say, would be similar to myself. I mean, the first one that came to mind to me was Jonathan Taylor. I mean, I'll just tell you. you know, right well, yeah. yeah, well, J J Jonathan Taylor, he, his ability to really, I mean, because he started slow. Yeah. Most people don't realize he, he started slow. And so, you know, the, the, you, you're questioning – whether he would be able to perform like he did at Wisconsin. But, I mean, what he's what he was able to do for a stretch there every week, it's not whether, whether he was going to get 100. It was like how much more over right. 100 was he going to have. And so he's been a very, very dominant player. And, you know, I, I love to see what he's able to do with Matt Ryan up there, being able to take some of that pressure off of him because as a running back, you know you're going to get eight in the box. Yep. Now the question is, can, can you counter it? So then the question becomes – uh, as a guy who played in the SEC, played at Ole Miss, and went to the Saints, there's a interesting quarterback prospect in this year's draft, Matt Corral. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about his game and his potential at the next level? Well, I love I love his game. I love the, the the leadership qualities that he has as a quarterback. You know, and he really grew from uh, the previous year to last year. And what I mean by that is taking care of the football. Yeah. I mean, because you're the quarterback, you have to be able to take care of it. You have to be able to protect the football. And cutting down on the interceptions was one of the things that he had to do. The one thing, and, and, and the league is changing, the one thing I'm interested to do as far as some of the running that he did last year, you know, not necessarily an OPO, but just really, I mean, um, uh, uh, the option as far as being able to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it or taking it from a quarterback. He was He put up a pretty good amount of rushing yards, and that's one of the things that, I don't know if you're going to really do a lot of in the NFL. He's got a nice arm. 
I would truly be surprised if he is not a first rounder. I know some 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 mock drafts have him going maybe late first or even early second. I think he is a young man that can come in and help you be able to win as far as on your NFL team. Well, you know, the Saints are an interesting position for him because, uh, you know, I think Jameis is there and they're looking at this as a, yeah, maybe going forward. Would it would it make sense for them, do you think, to take a flyer if he is available a little later on in the draft to take a guy who they could develop behind Jameis for a little bit? Well, I would not be surprised if the Saints do pick a quarterback. You know, right now you're hearing one of the things, you know, if I'm seeing them, I think they've got to get it figured out at the left tackle position. Yeah. Uh, you did lose Teron Armstead to Miami as far as free agency is concerned. Uh, I, I think you've got to be able to come up with a long-term decision there at the left tackle position. Uh, stability at the quarterback position is going to be key. I know James is coming off of ACL injury, so you know, not to say there's a lot of concern there, but there has to be there's some concern always some. There. Yeah, there's always yeah, some. There, there, there is some, some concern there. So, I mean – if you feel like the value is there, then I think that you do pull the trigger for a quarterback. What would you say now to people who are getting to go through this draft process? They all think they're going to be first rounders, or most of yeah. them do. And uh, uh, some of them won't, and some of them will go through what you went through. But, you know, everyone wants to hear their name called. They want to walk across that stage or get that phone call when they're with their family. And it's going to come later for a lot of them than they think. What advice would you give these kids as they're beginning to go through this process? At the end of the day, if you're not first round, I, I know some guys are going to be disappointed. Uh, it, it does not matter. Yeah. Yes, it matters at, at a point. But when you walk in that locker room with the NFL guys, guys that are trying to make that squad or guys that are on that squad, they want to know one thing. Are you committed to work? Yeah. Are you committed to coming in and working and helping us win? We don't care if you're a first rounder. We don't care if you're an undrafted rookie free agent. Are you willing to work and help us win? And that's really all you want. You know, you want to earn the respect of the guys that are there. You want to earn the respect of the guys that have played six, seven, eight years in the league. And they want to know if you come in thinking, well, I'm, 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 I'm an All-American. You know, I'm a college All-American. That's okay. What does that mean here? Yeah. You know, that, that that nobody cares about that. Prove it. Are you, yeah, are you willing to study? Are you willing to learn? And are you willing to help us win in this league? That's what they care about. And that's why I think the draft is fascinating because it's the culmination of something, all the work you put in in high school and college. So it's like the end of something, but it's also yeah. the beginning. And I think some people have a hard time understanding that. Well, when you, when you walk in that locker room, that's the, the guys will tell you, hey, look, yeah, hey, Rook, yeah. go, go get me breakfast <laughs> yeah. uh, or, 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 or or make sure that you bring me some coffee. Yeah. But outside of that, I, I need your talent to help me win. Yeah. And some, some, some guys are being drafted to take that veteran spot. Yeah. And that veteran understands and knows that. And he's going to do everything in his power to try not to lose that spot. So it, it, it's, it's going to be a friendly competition, but they care one, not one bit of where you were drafted. They want to know, can you help them win? Yeah. And that's why the draft is so much fun because it's, to me, having done it all these years, it's the ultimate reality television show. None of us know what's going to happen. And we just sort of let it unfold, which is why these journeys and the reflections and the memories that you have are so interesting. And that's why we wanted to share them uh, with uh, the people that are watching this now. Uh, listen, Deuce, thanks once again for being with us. We appreciate your time and sharing these draft journeys that all these players will be going through. And hopefully our listeners and watchers here at Caesar Sportsbook will uh, appreciate that journey as well. No problem. Thank you for having me on. And, you know, to the, to everyone that's going to be drafted, and even if you're not drafted, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. You can still go out there and compete. That's what it's all about.